Life is complicated, unpredictable, and always changing. What always worked yesterday doesn't always work tomorrow. What you thought you had figured out doesn't always work out. Or just when you thought you had all the answers dialed in, you suddenly realized in a moment of failure, you don't have a clue. No matter who you are or where you live, one thing remains the same. Life happens. And when it does, it rarely sends an email letting you know. Work, money, relationships, parenting, marriage, adversity, career path, future plans, your life and your legacy are directly connected to the decisions you make in response to life's challenges and opportunities. Which is why, more than anything, you need wisdom. Wisdom you don't always have, but thankfully, because of God's Word and His Holy Spirit, wisdom you can get. Welcome to our series where five preachers tackle 10 topics with one goal, to help you get wisdom. So, we have all been told at one point or another, or probably multiple points in our lives, we've all been told, don't get your hopes up. We've all been told that. Hey, don't, don't get your hopes up. But today, I think God's Word actually has the exact opposite message for us. So we're going to talk about get your hopes up. I think that that's what the Lord wants to speak to us this morning through his word. Get your hopes up. We're going to talk about hope. Now, I have a, uh, I have a two-year-old redhead, redheaded daughter. Uh, she'll be three in December. And her name is Eden Hope. Her middle name is actually Hope. And she has developed an amazing strategy for asking me for things that she wants. Like, it's, like it, it impresses me. The first, thing, her, her fir- the first thing that she will often do is she will carefully craft her question, her request, so that it sounds like everything that she wants is actually a need essential to her very survival. <laughs> Dada. I need some ice cream. (laughs) I get this all the time. Dada, I need some ice cream. And if that's not impressive enough, the other strategy she she employs, I think, is even more impressive. She, She has learned, she's two years old, she's two years old, she has learned how to build communal consensus around her desires. So this is the question I, I think I get even more than, Dad, I need ice cream, is I get this question. Now, just let, this, let the brilliance of this sink in. Dad, should we get some ice cream? <laughs> should we get some ice cream? Like, that's, like, this kid's going places. That's amazing. She has learned how to build communal consensus around her desire because she knows, right, that as her dad, if what she wants becomes what I want, it will greatly increase the probability that she'll get what she wants, right? This is amazing. Now, now, my job as her dad is to provide for her essential needs, right? Room, or, you know, uh, roof over her head, food in her stomach, clothes on her back, right? Like, I, I need to provide her essential needs, but it's also my job to help shape her desires. So, like, if at the end of the day, she, she uh, has all of her basic needs met, and she finally learns that ice cream is not actually a need, it's a want. Like, if, if, that's, if that's the end of the story at the end of the day, I will have not done my job adequately, because it's, it's my job to, to help shape that desire that she currently has for ice cream and help direct it towards something that can actually fulfill her, right? Something that can actually meet her deepest desires. See, human desire is not, it's not a bad thing, but it's probably the most powerful thing about you. Human desire is not a bad thing, but it is probably the most powerful thing about you. What you desire will determine the course of your life, and it can go towards destruction, or it can go towards flourishing. And so God is, is a good father, much better father than me, by the way. And he wants 
to align our desires toward what will actually fulfill us, namely towards himself. And hope, the, 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 the big idea of hope this morning is that hope begins when we discover that we need God and hope will grow when we discover that, or, or hope will gr- grow rather when we want what God wants. Hope will, will begin in our lives when we discover that we need God. Hope will grow in our lives when we begin to want what God wants wants. See, the things that you want are the things you're convinced you're, that, that you need, right? And this is where we often get, get in trouble, right? Man, I, I know, this, I know this, this relationship is a total train wreck and not honoring to the Lord at all, but, but man, I just, I just need this boyfriend or this girlfriend because I don't want to be alone. Right? Did you, did you pick up on that? Man, you know, I, 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 know, I, I know I've probably been drinking too much, but, man, I just need that extra drink every day because I want to escape from the stress. Man, I know this, I know this business deal is, like, probably a little bit ethically questionable, but, but I, I, I need to go through with it because I want a higher standard of living. It could sound very religious, too. Man, I need to keep all the rules, perform in this way, pretend in that way, overachieve in this goal, because I want to be better than everybody else. That one's for for everyone who, during the first three examples, were going, not me, not me, not me, gotcha, right? (laughs) Welcome, Welcome to the sermon, good to have you. Hope begins when we discover that we need God, Hope grows when we want what God wants. So, I want to uh, direct our attention to this amazing passage in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 13, 12 through 14. If you have a Bible, you can turn there. If not, you can just, you can just follow with me on this TV if you can see it. Proverbs 13, 12 through 14. Three verses here. I'll give you guys a second. You guys are flipping your pages. It's a good sound. Proverbs 13, 12 through 14. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Whoever despises the word brings destruction on himself, but he who reveres the commandment will be rewarded. The teaching of the wise is a fountain of life that one may turn away from the snares of death. Here's what's amazing about this passage is there's actually two symbols of eternal life in the passage. Did you, did you, did you catch those? Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a what? Say it out loud. Tree of, life. Tree of life. It's a symbol of eternal life, right? Whoever despises the word brings destruction on himself, but he who reveres the commandment will be rewarded. The teaching of the wise is a fountain of life, right? There's our second symbol that one may turn away from death. So what that does, right, because we, we've, got, we've got a symbol of, et- of eternal life at the beginning, or at least near the beginning, we've got a symbol of eternal life near the end, and so what that does is it makes the verse in the middle stand out. Whoever despises the word brings destruction on himself. So when, like when we start from the beginning, hope deferred makes the heart sick, and we all just go, yes, right? Like, I, like, I've experienced that. We've all experienced that. I, I love this about the Bible. It, it is honest about the human experience, is it not? It speaks to our everyday problems. It's not, it's not for advanced spiritual people. It's for real people in real life with real problems. So we can all relate to that. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. We've all experienced that moment when what we were hoping for does not happen. And it's, for me, I, I don't know about, but like for me, like it's literally like this feeling of disappointment in my gut. It, 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 have, has anyone else feel that? The gut feeling, right? Where you're just like, ah, right? Just kind of like this depressive sigh, you know? Ah. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. So we have to ask, like, what, what desire 
What desire is a tree of life? And I think the answer is in the middle. It's in the next verse. Whoever despises the word, maybe we could say it this way, whoever does not desire the word of God. Right? That's what brings destruction. So if we were to reverse it, say it positively, whoever desires and obeys the word of God, right, that will lead, that will lead not to destruction, that'll lead to blessing, right? That'll lead to flourishing in their life. And I think that's the desire that's being talked about in that first verse, right? When, it, when a desire, in other words, when a desire that is in line with God's desires is fulfilled in our hearts, that is the tree of life of hope that we're talking about. Now, a quick, a quick uh, word about this word hope. We, in one sense, we use this word hope uh, uh, in a very biblical way because we use, we use this word hope to, um, to communicate our wants, and that's very biblical, right? If a, if a married couple says, we're hoping to go to Hawaii on our next anniversary, they're really saying we want to go to Hawaii, right? That's, that's a word of desire. And, and that's right here in this verse, right? Hope deferred makes the heart sick. A desire fulfilled is a tree of life. But there's another way that we use this word hope that is actually completely contrary to the biblical idea of hope, and that is we use the word hope to communicate doubt, which is very ironic. Well, I just hope it all works out. Well, yeah, let's hope so. Isn't that amazing? What we're saying there is that we want it to work out, but that we doubt it will. And so the way that we use the word hope often is we use it as a word of desire with a foundation of doubt. And I think God wants to change our perspective on what hope is in Christ. And that is that it's a word of desire with a foundation of faith. So check out these, these uh, verses. Psalm 71.5, For you have been my hope, sovereign Lord, my confidence from my youth. Hope and confidence are literally paralleled there. They're synonyms in this verse. Here's another one. Hebrews 11.1, 1, Faith is the, say it out loud, confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. Hope is a word of desire with a foundation of faith, not doubt. So I want to give you, I want to give you a definition for the word hope. So you can write this down if you want. Hope is the life-changing, confident desire and the certain expectation, not uncertain expectation, certain expectation that God will do what he has said he will do. Hope is the life-changing, and it is life-changing, confident desire and the certain expectation that God will do what he has said he will do. It's really interesting. Hope is the undercurrent of all of our favorite stories, right? Like if a story leads us to completely and utterly give up um, on the idea that there's still hope for redemption, right? Like those kind of stories are the ones we, we give up on. Now, great stories will challenge your belief that there's still hope. They will test your faith. Sounds familiar, right? They test your faith, but they don't lead you to utter despair. Uh, George Lucas, when he was um, drafting the very first Star Wars movie back in the 70s, you know, what, you know what the name of the first Star Wars movie was, by the way? Anyone? A New, a New Hope, yes. When he was writing the script for that, there was a character. This is, I love this, this is amazing. There was a character in his first script, and his name was Cain Starkiller. <laughs> Cain Starkiller, whom you have never heard of because he didn't make it to the final script. Can, it, can anyone guess? what Cain Starkiller's name was changed to? 
I heard Darth Vader, which is very interesting, right? <laughs> Luke Skywalker. Kane Starkiller became Luke Skywalker. And I feel pretty confident in saying that like, if Luke Skywalker's name would have been Kane Starkiller, they would not still be making Star Wars movies 40 years later. <laughs> but they are. They're still making Star Wars movies 40 years later. And they're, and they're amazing, and they're making a ton of money. Why? Hope. There's no hope in the name Kane Starkiller. That's not a very hopeful name. Luke Skywalker, that's like the cine cinematic synonym for the word. That, that, his name, like, it, it equals hope, right? Luke, I mean, there's no name more hopeful than Luke Skywalker in movie history, probably. And that's why the Star Wars franchise is worth $10 billion. $10 billion because we love hope. Hope is the undercurrent of our favorite story. So I want to I invite us into the story of hope, the story of, of God's hope, of hope in Christ in your life. There's going to be three acts, and each act is going to have two different scenes, okay? The story of hope. Act one, scene one. You ready? Who's ready? All right. Okay. Helpless. That's the title of Act One, Scene One of the Story of Hope. Do you have hope yet? Feel hopeful? No. <laughs> what a great way to start. Um, helpless. Helpless. Helplessness is the, is the soil in your life in which the seed of hope will be planted. I'll explain. In the book of Proverbs, it's very clear, when you, when you look up all the verses about hope in the book of Proverbs, you walk away with this main principle, and that is, the righteous have hope. The wicked do not. Two verses for you. The evildoer, Proverbs 24, 20, the evildoer has no hope, and the lamp of the wicked will be snuffed out. Now, this is the most famous verse in the book of Proverbs, probably. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. Who's heard that before? Who has that on a coffee mug? Keep your hands up. Come on. Don't be embarrassed. We'll just make fun of you for a little bit. Okay. Um, check this out. Who are the righteous? Who are the wicked? The righteous have hope. Who are they? The righteous are the ones who do this verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In other words, come to the realization that apart from God, you are in fact helpless. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Who are the wicked? Very next verse, be not wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. The wicked are the ones who are wise in their own eyes. That is the very definition of the wicked in the book of Proverbs. The ones who don't think that they need God, the ones who don't think that they need any advice or any wisdom. The, one, the, the wicked are those who are wise in their own eyes. In other words, the wicked are the ones that think they don't need help. The righteous are the ones who understand that that I fundamentally need help. Apart from God, I am absolutely helpless to save myself, helpless to help myself. This is the starting point for hope. The starting point of hope in your life is when you realize that you need God. And that's why helplessness is the soil for the seed of hope in your life. This is, this is like the heart of, this is the heart of the good news. This is the heart of what we believe, right? That, that we can't save ourselves, but praise be to God, he has sent someone who can, right? And we are saved not by, our own, not by helping ourselves, we're saved by putting our faith in the only one who can help us, namely Jesus Christ. Is that, like, is that good news for anybody this morning? Amen. Hello. That's the best news you'll hear all day. Helplessness is the soil. 
Act one, scene two, scene transition. Helpless, not hopeless. Helpless, not hopeless. Helplessness is, is the soil, but once we realize that we're, that we're helpless, we realize at, at the same time, we realize that we're not hopeless, right? We're helpless, but we're not hopeless. Why? Because there is a helper. Because God has, in fact, acted on our behalf. He has, in fact, sent Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, rose again from the dead. God has helped, like, so, like some of you pray, some, some of your, your, uh, your favorite prayer to pray is God, help me, <laughs> right? How often, how often do you think that prayer gets prayed every day around the world? God, help me. I'm thinking a lot. I pray that prayer a lot. God, help me. I think God's answer to some of you this morning would be, I have. I have helped you. I sent Jesus. And, and it gets better. Like, I have helped you and I do help you because I sent the Holy Spirit. And that's how I can be your ever-present help in times of trouble. So I want to give you a new prayer to pray. Helpless, not hopeless. I want to give you a new prayer to pray. I'm going to give you a few of these this morning. Instead of, instead of only praying, God, help me, start praying, Holy Spirit, hope, fill me. This is where our faith goes from believing that God can help us to believing that he will help us. Don't just pray, God, help me. Pray that prayer. It's a great prayer, great prayer to pray. But also pray, Holy Spirit, hope, fill me. Act 2, scene 1. Hardship. Oh, man. It's like just when it was... The Sermon on Hope was kind of starting to sound hopeful. Hardship. Hardship in your life is the seed that goes into the soil that will grow the tree of hope. I've got a uh, verse for you, a passage for you. Romans 5, 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God, right? That's, that's, our, that's our hope. That's our good news, right? That, yeah, we're helpless, but we are not hopeless, right? We've been justified through faith. We have peace with God. We, we actually boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Ooh. Man, it's starting to sound really good there. Suffering? Yeah, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perse perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Another translation says hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So I want to I say something, and it, it, might, it might sound a little, little radical, but uh, hope, it, 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 well, I'll say it this way, it is impossible, it is impossible to be disappointed by hope that is truly set in God. It is impossible to be disappointed by hope that is truly set in God. Some of you are like, wait, 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 wait a minute. I've put my hope in God and I've been disappointed lots. And I just have to ask, like, where, where was your hope? Was it, was, it in, was it in the giver or was it in, in the gifts? Was it in the blessings or was it in the one who, who blesses? Like, was your hope really in God? Because this passage that we just read teaches us, like God has spoken on this issue. You cannot be disappointed by hope that is truly set in God. Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit 
who has been given to us. It's like, like where, where's the hardship in your life, right? Is it, is it in your marriage? Is it, is it your relationships? Is it in your singleness? Is it in your job? Is it in your, in your school? Is it uh, through, through death of a, of a loved one? All of those things are very real, and, and, and the Bible wants us, wants us to be honest about suffering. Like, we don't, we don't have this, this uh, fake view of life. Life is hard. But when we put our hope in God, it is impossible to be truly disappointed by that hope. We might experience disappointments in other things, right? And that's the process. That's, that's hardship. That's what hardship does. And it helps to root out the foundation of our hope, and it helps us to put our hope in something that is more secure, namely putting our hope in Jesus, right? So hardship in your life should not result in your disappointment with God, but should rather be recognized as your appointment with him. Hardship is your appointment with God. It's the seed of hope that goes into the soil. Similarly, hardship in your life is not God's disappointment with you. And some of you need to hear that and just let that weight fall off your shoulders this morning. Hardship in your life is not God's disappointment with you. Hardship in your life is, once again, your appointment with God. You can write that down if you want. Hardship in your life is not God's disappointment with you, neither should it be your disappointment with him. It's your appointment with him. This is when God wants to speak to you. This is when God wants to help you put your hope in him. Hardship is actually the prerequisite for hope in the passage we just, we just read. Isn't that amazing? If you just break down everything in the middle, that what that passage says is suffering leads to hope. Why? Act two, scene two, is that we become holy through hardship. This is the fertilizer. We've got the soil of helplessness, but not hopelessness. We've got the seed of hope, which is hardship, and we've got the fertilizer, which is holiness. Now, this is when, this is when, going back to the beginning of, of our time together, this is when our desires be begin to be aligned with God's desires, right? Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's about desire, it's about what you love, ultimately. This is when what you want becomes what God wants. You've, you've admitted that you need God, and now you're going to begin to want what God wants, and hope is really going to begin to grow in your life. So, so the, the battle of temptation and sin in our life, right, is never, is never the battle between doing the right thing, holiness, or doing the better thing, sin. That's not the battle. The battle is wanting the better thing, holiness, and giving up on our desire for the lesser thing, sin. God doesn't hold out on you. He doesn't hold out on you. His ways, his, his laws, his following him is the best thing for you. And, 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 and so the, the problem is not, right, that we desire sin too much. The problem is that we desire, we desire things that are too little, right? Sin is, too, sin is a very cheap thing to want. And God wants, here, now I love this, I love this. God wants more for me than I want for me. And God wants more for you than you want for you. And that's amazing news. I was thinking even just this morning, like, uh, I, have an, I have amazing parents. God, God blessed me with amazing parents. And I'm really glad that growing up, my parents wanted more for me than I wanted for me. I'm glad that they, they could, they had this vision for, for the future, not that they were trying to, 
you know, control me and, and make me go, you know, a particular way, but they had this vision for the future of my life, and it was bigger than, than what my vision was as, as a little kid. They had, they had experience and wisdom and, and knowledge, and, and because of their love for me, they wanted more for me than I even knew how to want or imagine for myself. And then as I grew up, they, they helped me develop my own desire and imagination towards God and towards what would really fulfill me. That's amazing parenting, and God is like that, except even better, right? God is that kind of father. He wants more for us than we want for ourselves, and he, he aligns our desires with his. See, the good news of the gospel is not just you're forgiven, now you can leave. The good news of the gospel is you're forgiven, and now enter into my joy. And I, and, and I have something for you to do. Christian hope, your hope in Christ, like our hope in Christ, it's not the hope of perpetual survival. We don't, we don't put our hope in just barely making it. Hope in Christ is the hope of glory. Our hope leads to eternal, not just eternal perpetual survival, but eternal significance. That we get to, we get to be put to work in the kingdom of God. He wants more for us than we even know how to want for ourselves. And holiness is the process by which our deepest wants are aligned with God's. So it's the fertilizer that grows the tree. I want to give you a new prayer to pray. We often pray in the middle of hardship, God, get me out of this. What we need to pray is, God, help me to get more of you out of this. Don't just pray, God, get me out of this. It's okay to pray for God to intervene in your life. It's okay to do, it's okay to do that. It's okay to pray for healing. It's, it's okay to pray for a miracle. But don't just pray, God, get me out of this. Pray, God, help me to get more of you out of this. Act 3, scene 1, is hold hope. And now we get to eat the fruit of the tree, of this tree of life that Proverbs talks about is that we get to hold our hope. Hebrews 10, 19 through 23, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we, pro we profess. For he who promised is faithful. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. For he who promised is faithful. This is where we eat the fruit of the tree of hope in our life. This is where you've got to start, you've got to start meditating on and thinking on and believing in the promises of God. You've got to start letting your faith in what God has done inform your hope for what God will do. Our faith in what God has done informs our hope for what God will do do. So, like, what does God say? What are his promises? His promises are, if I began a good work in you, I will bring it to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. His promises to us are that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. His promise to us is that he has chosen us before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him, that he's adopted us into his family to be his sons and his daughters. His promise is that he will make all things new. In fact, he even says, if anyone is in Christ, behold, 
They are new. They are a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. Jesus says, I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you, even to the end of the age. And he promises that he will return and he will judge the living and the dead and he will establish his kingdom and he will destroy all of our enemies and death will be no more and Satan will be no more and sin will be no more and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's our hope. You got to start believing what God says. What God says he will do, he will do. That's hope. It's the confident desire. We, say, we, we don't just expect it to happen. We want it to happen. We want God to do all that he says he will do because we want God. We want his kingdom. It's the confident desire and the certain expectation that what God has said he will do, he will do. Act 3, scene 2, our final scene. Hope held high. When we hold hope, hope will be held high. We eat the fruit of hope in our lives, and guess what happens? The shade of the tree covers us, and there's room for other people to come and sit under the shade of the tree of hope in our lives. One of my favorite promises that God makes in his word is that he has, this is from Ephesians 2, he has prepared in advance good works for us to walk in. Now everybody, like the famous verse is the one right before that. And it's it's an amazing verse. By grace you've been saved through faith, not of works, so that no one may boast. That's an amazing, oh, phew. Thank you, Lord. It's not about what I do. It's about what Jesus has done. That's amazing news. That's the gospel. But God promises more than that. I've saved you by my grace through faith, and I've given you something to do. I've given you something to do. Continuing on in this passage in Hebrews, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up on meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but in, you know who you are, by the way, uh, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. As you see the day approaching. What is the day? The day is when Christ will return. The day is when Christ will make all things new. The day is when Christ will put every wrong to right. The day is when Christ will put an end to all of his enemies and all of our enemies. The day is when Christ will return to bring us home into his kingdom. And until that day, until that day, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Here's a new prayer to pray. Pray, come Lord Jesus. Not because you want him to take you away. And isn't that how we pray that prayer? Come, Lord Jesus. What we really mean is, God, where's the eject button? (laughs) Get me out of this. Though I just can't, like, wow. The world is just too messed up. Come, Lord Jesus. What if we prayed that prayer and really meant it? Pray, come, Lord Jesus, not because you want him to take you away, but because you want him to put you to work. Like what if we prayed, come Lord Jesus, not, not, not help me find the eject button, but you know what, come Lord Jesus into my marriage. It's a, it's a, it's a mess and, and I, I need you, I need your help. But come Lord Jesus, put me to work in my marriage to do what you wanna do in me and through me. Come Lord Jesus into my relationships to do what you wanna do in me and through me. Come, Lord Jesus, into my workplace to do what you want to do, to bring your kingdom here and now. Come, Lord Jesus, into my singleness. I don't understand, Lord, but come, Lord Jesus, into my life. Come, Lord Jesus, into the mess and put us to work in the mess to bring your kingdom 
now. Come, Lord Jesus. I'm going to invite the uh, band to come on out. And as I was, um, as I was thinking about this prayer, come, Lord Jesus, that we love to pray. I, I, I was thinking, and I, I believe that the Holy Spirit was, was uh, putting this on my heart, and, and that is, we pray that prayer, come, Lord Jesus, and I think that Jesus is saying to some of you, come to me. Come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. That's the beginning of hope, admitting that you're helpless without him. And the good news of the gospel, like we're, like we're helpless apart from God, but we're not hopeless because we're no longer apart from God. Because Jesus has come. We say, come Lord Jesus. Jesus says, I, I did. I did come. And now you can come to me. I think, I think, you know, as I look back on this summer, like it's been an amazing summer at Grace City Church. It's been an amazing summer. We've heard some amazing messages. We baptized 23 people at our summer blast. And every single one of those people, yeah, you can clap for that. That's... Every single person we baptized has experienced this story, the story of hope. And I, and I think, I think, you know, it, it, could, it could be that some of you, you've been coming every week, and, and every time you come, you hear the sermon, and you're just absolutely convinced that it was custom designed for you, right? Like you heard, like you, at the beginning of the summer, you came, and Pastor Josh got up here and said, we're going to talk about money, and you're like, oh boy, I really need to hear this sermon on money. Wow. And then he, then he got up the next week, and it was another sermon on money, and you're like, pfft. I really needed to hear two sermons on money. And then you heard Pastor Kent preach about priorities, and you're like, wow, that, that really hit me. In fact, one of the, guy, one of the guys who got baptized, that's, that's when he got saved, is when he heard that sermon about getting his rocks in order, getting his priorities right. And then you heard, then you heard, uh, you heard Pastor Kerry, and he... And he preached about fear, and you're like, oh man, I have a lot of fear in my life. Wait, are they, is someone like tipping these guys off? And you heard, you heard Pastor Mike from uh, Sage Hills, and he, he preached about guarding your heart, and, you, and you're like, oh man, I'm just reading my mail. And then you heard another sermon on fear, and you're like, whew, I didn't know there was more to fear, but there's more to fear. And then you, and maybe you heard a sermon on hope today, and, and you're like, I could use some of that. And, and what you're tempted to do, what you're tempted to do is, is leave this place, get in your car, and go, you know, if, if God would just give me a sign, if God would just give me a sign, I would, I would I'd surrender. I'd submit my, I'd follow Jesus then, if he'd just give me a sign. He's been giving you a sign every week you've been coming. The sermon has been custom designed for you. No one tipped us off. That's the Holy Spirit talking to you. That's, that is the voice of God in your heart drawing you home. And Jesus is saying today, he's, today, he's saying to some of you, come, come home. Come home. You want some hope? I got some hope. You want to be free of your fear? I can do that work. You want to get your, you want to get your money in order and, and everything else in your life that's chaotic in order? Come home. Want to get your priorities right? Come home. You want, to, you, want to, you want to stop just barely making it? You want to stop just surviving? You want to step into significance? Come home. Come home. I invite us to stand. Lord Jesus, I pray for every person in this room. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would do a work. Would you do a work in my own heart, my own life, and would you do a work in all of our lives, Lord, as we come to you, admitting, admitting, Father, that we are helpless.
helpless apart from you, but we are not hopeless because we are no longer apart from you. Praise be to God. You have done something. You have helped us. And you can give us hope. You do give us hope. You, you have helped us and you do help us. I pray, Lord, for those that need to come home right now, that you would give them the courage they need to make that decision, Lord, that you would meet them exactly where they're at. There's the, the prerequisite for coming home is admitting that you're helpless. It's not having everything together. Lord, some people here today think that their helplessness is, is what has disqualified them from, from following you, when in fact it's their helplessness that actually qualifies them to follow you. Lord, I pray that you would do your work, that you would, that you would draw us closer to yourself and that you would continue to grow the seed and the tree of hope in your life. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's sing together.